Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss the exciting science behind HRV and how you can apply it to your own health and the work that you do. Just a note, this podcast does not replace medical advice, and if you're going to apply this to your own life or others, please consult with a medical provider. Thank you and enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am Matt back here again, flying a little solo. I'll just give you a hi from Jeff. Uh, we're keeping him busy uh, uh, right now. But uh, I want to introduce the uh, second installment of the Wayback Machine. Uh, bring in uh, uh, Jerry and Kurt back uh, for, for this episode. Again, recorded in uh, 2018. Uh, when I uh, first was learning about heart rate variability, uh, I re-listened to this episode and really enjoyed it. Uh, it's kind of fun to look back at yourself two years. Uh, I, I believe I cut it out of this episode uh, for editing and time's sake, but I, I realized I couldn't even pronounce autonomic nervous system. Uh, you know, so it's just kind of hilarious for me to look back and now I've got this book, podcast, really all about this part of the nervous system that even... Uh, uh, two years ago, I could not pronounce. So um, I think this is a really great episode. We uh, stayed at the beginning that we are going to go through two articles. Uh, we only went through one. Um, we're saving the other one for the episode. So uh, I will attach a link uh, to the aforementioned uh article in the show notes. So you can find that at heartratevariability.com. Uh, hopefully we do a good job um, of summarizing this, uh, but listening back to it, I think we do. But uh, just in case you want to take a deeper dive with us, uh, that is there as well. So um, hey, enjoy uh, Kurt, Jerry, and Matt show. Uh, we'll see you next week. So I had a, a kind of a secondary bright, shiny object after our episode uh, was released. I got multiple text messages from former colleagues and friends who had listened to it and are doing some of, continuing some of the work that we started in using heart rate to help treat uh, children both, uh, both uh, with intellectual disabilities, with traumatic exposure. And so that it was just a lot of, I got a lot of feedback and a lot of actual questions, which are not, is nice. Uh, cool. I have some questions. So I'll, I'll try and kind of hit on a few of those too. And uh, also, uh, I, I, uh, these two articles that I, that I tossed out today, um, I've, I've recently just reread them. I kind of finished before we started talking today. And, uh, my, my first reaction to it was, wow, they're dense. <laughs> there's, there's a lot in there. Uh, there's a lot of data, a lot of statistics in there and a lot of results to kind of go through and it could be pretty overwhelming. So I just kind of thinking about these two articles and really why I picked these two articles and some of the points that came out of them that were, that were pretty important for me. Um, so this, the first one I wanna talk about is uh, the article that, that uh, talks about heart rate variability as a biomarker for uh, autonomic differences between children with uh, chronic pain and those without. Sorry, my dogs are playing. Let me, let me correct them really quickly. <laughs> Do some behavioral intervention. You shock? <laughs> <laughs> Ring the bell. Ring the bell. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, Kurt. Sorry about that. They were just getting loud. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, this article about comparing children with chronic pain to children with uh, healthy controlled children on a pain related task, right? So this experiment was taking these two groups of children, one who experienced pain every day, almost constantly every day, and then children who do not, and then they actually compared their response of their nervous system to tasks that were related to actually causing pain. Matt, here's where you can insert your comments about the cruelty of psychological research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds terrible, right? But, uh, yeah. It, I think the, the main publishing body was in Great Britain, so we can we can okay. England for this one. The English. Yeah, sure. I'm, although I'm looking at the article and, and there's like UCLA on there and things yeah. like that. So maybe you can talk to them next time you go back to California. I'm there next week, so I'll have a chat yeah. with them. 
So I think this is really interesting in one sense in that when we look at some of the, also the literature about physical pain and response to physical pain and the, the physiological and psychological responses to psychological or emotional pain, they're quite similar. And that our bodies react really similarly to both of those kinds of events. And so I looked at this one and said, this is a great way of us understanding that there are difference in our physiological response patterns when we have different life experiences. So that's one of the main points of this first article. And as you read through these, I love reading through these articles because oftentimes in the introduction section, you get these great um, kind of snippets and you know, two paragraph kind of explanations of really complex phenomena like heart rate variability or uh, parasympathetic sympathetic balance and vagal tone. And you get some nice words to use around what these processes and what these phenomena actually are. So that's some of the utility of, of, of these articles. So this article is pretty interesting in its, in its um, results, and it showed pretty clearly that among the, these two groups of children, one, they didn't necessarily show that children who had um, chronic pain, had a, they had a different response to pain-related events from healthy control children. But the response was kind of like, it wasn't what you would kind of expect. It was an attenuated response. So their nervous system was actually less responsive to pain-related tasks than it was to the healthy control children. So as we think about some of this fight or flight, right, and we think about hyperarousal a lot and being triggered a lot, that's only one pathway that exposure to adverse childhood experiences can change how we react to environmental events. Another way is it can produce some dissociation from those events or an under-responsiveness to those events. So it gave us some, some physiological mechanisms to kind of understand that and see those results um, when we compared the physiology of these two groups. So I like this one. This is a great one for some of those explanations and a great example of showing differences in how we respond to pain, uh, which is a nice corollary from physical pain to, to emotional and psychological pain as well. That's, that's kind of overview of the first one. Um, I want, and I kind of want to, I want to throw it to you guys and see if, if there are any kind of things that I missed that you're thinking as you thought about this article or read this article or any questions that came up for you that you think our listeners would want to kind of know about from this one and before I go on to that second one. So um, let me kick it to you first, Matt, if there's anything you're thinking based yeah. on I mean, I, I just think it's 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 fascinating to see, and I don't think I mean reading this wasn't a surprise um, from everything we've talked about. But I think you know it's just really powerful as you know the, these came out a couple of years ago now, I believe, and it's just like understanding. I, I think you know it kicked me back to my training and thinking about psychology, and really we talked about psychology as almost this thing. That, that was interdependent. There was like this mental functioning that was different than biological functioning. That, that there was, yeah, there was kind of, we, we were trying to put mind and body back together again. The biopsychosocial model kind of gave us ways to think about that. But it, I think well, what, what these really show to me and what a whole bunch of, I think, where the research has gone in recent years is really that the power of um, experiences in our environment, especially as intense as trauma, and how our biology really adapts in ways that, that are really powerful. Um, and in, again, with repeated extreme trauma, you get these extreme reactions to both, you know, social, uh, psychological, cognitive responses. And to see some of this stuff come out on you know, the, the, the pain piece, chronic pain, lupus, um, cancer, and all these other biological responses. Uh, you know, again, it, it's really challenged, uh, you know, what I got trained on a, a decade and a half or so ago um, as biology and psychology, mind and body, um, so intertwined now that it's hard, it's impossible, I think, to talk about one outside the context of the other. And that's where I think this this work is a reminder of the, the power of that. Yeah. And I think notably, too, as you talk about the different areas 
where we've tried to separate all these different areas. And we've kind of talked about this on, in some of our conversations that we study things in isolation. Mm -hmm. We study them as if they are isolated systems, not interacting with other systems. And we do that because we need to characterize them and understand them in order to understand the whole. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to start thinking that it's compartmentalized. Yeah. So I think a, a kind of a corollary to that or an example of how important it is to put these things back together is looking at things from multiple perspectives and then trying to integrate them. So one of the reasons why I like this article as well and would like to use this article is that it's not published in any kind of psychology journal. This comes from the Journal of Pain Research. So as we think about gathering perspectives and understanding different perspectives, I think that's a, a nice way for us to start thinking about how can we get information from other, other disciplines' perspectives and other people's perspectives to integrate into kind of a holistic view of, of what's happening. Yeah. Jerry, kick it to you. What what kind of thoughts are you are kicking around in your head? You know, I uh, what was I was thinking as I read through it, um, as I've thought through this, is that this is a measure of general efficiency and stability of the nervous system, right? Kind of looking at that. Is that That, where's that coming from? That's Matt. Yeah, that's that's my phone. Sorry. Oh, I, I I was thinking my nervous system is really. <laughs> yeah. So so um so you know we can think about it as a a general measure of flexibility and adaptability that, that some that individuals have right and that ex experiences that we have both externally and internally, whether it be a demand in the environment or internal distress, our nervous system has to be able to respond to those, but it also has to be able to return back to some level of baseline. Mm -hmm. That's our definition of resiliency, right? And so this, um, heart rate variability allows us in some ways to measure the efficiency and the effectiveness of our nervous system's ability to manage state changes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, in a way, it goes back to the, the model thinking about, there was a time before we had thermometers to know what our temperature was. So we put our hand on our heads and we did it and we got an estimate, but now we can actually have something to go in and give us a number to say, yes, you know, you're hot, but you're really hot, right? So I think this, this, this measure really isn't something we didn't know subjectively, but it allows us to have a measure to go in and look at that. And then there are, there are some individuals who are going to be born and who have higher, higher heart rate variability that are by biologically more robust and able to manage. And there are some individuals who are born who are gonna be more vulnerable. And so as we begin to measure these, we can begin to think about the kind of interventions that individuals need in order to scaffold them and support them in, in their well-being. Right. So I, I really thought there was some really good takeaways from this as a way of um, adding to our capacity to get information mm -hmm. to identify what types of interventions and also to measure the effectiveness of interventions. Mm -hmm. right. Because in, in the past, what we used to do is measure cortisol levels as a indication of subjective stress. But what we now know is that experiences either increase cortisol levels or actually can actually decrease baseline cortisol levels. So you can't assume just because somebody has a low cortisol level that they're not stressed. Right, right. This is a different measure that allows us to answer that same kind of question. Right. When we actually saw that result in the second article, exactly, <laughs> there is actually you know there's some some nuance to to exactly. So I think it it really gives us another tool 
to begin to both assess what types of interventions to use, but also the effectiveness of the interventions we're using. Right. Yeah. right. Well, let me, let me, Kurt, I want, I want to throw something your, your way, too. As, as you know, as you look at this, because, you know, it, it's now we're like, I, I don't know, I always like go to history on some of this stuff, because I thought, you know, I think it was the Greeks who thought basically cognitive and mental functioning was in the heart. Um, you know, and they thought, I believe that the brain was just kind of an air conditioner for the rest of the body. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I, 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 I just find it fascinating. And then you look at all the gut research as well. And, and we kind of talk about in the skin in almost a, a generic way, because if not, then we have to like start to define all these things. And then we start to define all these, the brain, the heart, the gut, the nervous system, and then I think one of the things that I find fascinating with this is to look at one of those in isolation um, is really almost a, a false examination. Uh, just kind of like to say, oh, the prefrontal cortex is in charge of executive functioning. Well, that's an easy way, as Jerry says, every model is kind simple. of, yeah, yeah, it is. And yet it's so much more complex than that. So, you know, I, I wonder, you know, coming out of, you know, a, a, background and, and I, I know this whole this is going to way oversimplify the complexity of behavioralism but you know focusing a lot of times on stimulus a uh, leads to response b and somewhat you know and i know it's a lot more complex than that so i mean no disrespect to that but you know just, just like pavlov's dog you ring a bell and their salivation that that sort of you know very simplified thing and i, I kind of wonder from your perspective now that we have all this information coming out about gut health and, you know, the connection between the gut and the brain and the heart and the brain and the heart and the gut and just kind of what, what how's this inform your thinking um, of, of looking at, at different ways of uh, constructing interventions? So I'll kind of start with the, the to, this, to this day, as long as I've been doing behavioral interventions and thinking about this kind of thing, I still get fascinated by the information that we've learned over the last hundred years about how responsive organisms, including humans and other animals, how responsive we can be to environmental events and how understanding how the, be, uh, how the environment can impact behavior and then behavior can in turn impact the environment and that loop like without taking any of the physiology that, that we've learned and like all of that stuff, just that basic, kind of relational, interactional, transactional relationship. I still get fascinated by that. I still get jazzed by that. I still get excited about that, about understanding those things like stimulus control and, and things like phenomena like stimulus equivalence, how you can train a response to one type, kind of event and another one can become the exact same thing. Like how actually adaptive our bodies and our brains and our behavior is, I, to this day, get fascinated by that and excited by it. When I start to think about also, and I've, I've thought this for many years since I read some of, of B.F. Skinner's first work, and in the, in, the, in the late 1980s, he was asked a lot of questions about cognitive psychology, because that was starting to become the big rise in, in, in the cognitive movement, right? In the 80s, we got computers and we got new metaphors and we got new ways of thinking about things and so it started to change how people talked and wanted to understand the world and it, you know Skinner was a smart smart guy I mean he was a scary smart guy and one of the things that he said was he was still kind of saying we're not there yet these new metaphors are fine but they're still metaphors like we're, we're not quite to the point where we understand these things yet and he was still i think too fascinated by this interaction between environment and behavior and he said one day the physiologist of the future will be able to tell us what's going on inside of the skin but that day is not today that this was 60 70 years ago right and they had a, there was a ton of you know physiological research then that was really coming into into en vogue and was really exciting and I took that even when I was in grad school reading that and I was interested in physiology and neurobiology and thought I had to start looking into that because I'm now 60 years later and I'm, I'm now in the day that he was talking about then. Yeah. I ought to be interested in that. And so I really started getting into this and finding that 
you know, there, I think there's a, there's a phrase in one of these articles that says, and this is why I think the stress response is so incredibly important is that its major function is to create responses to external events, which is what I'm interested in, right? That, that's the thing that, I'm, that I get jazzed about. And this is the system that is really, really critical in developing those things. And the changes in this system change how we respond to environmental events. And that's really fascinating to me. And a great kind of, I love some of the detail of this article and, and some of these words can get really kind of overwhelming when you read them and you haven't read them before, right? Things like high frequency normalized power, right? And, you know, low, HF to LF frequency band power. Like if people reading that, I've got to be like, what the hell is that? Like, and how is that important? Right? But here's, I think that, I think if, if, the early behaviors who were so like, also interested in physiology could read this and understand that this measure, like it doesn't really measure, it doesn't really matter what high frequency normalized power is. You don't really have to understand what that is and how to calculate it to know that it's a measure of vagal tone. It's a measure of parasympathetic function within the autonomic nervous system. Well, that's pretty cool because we're talking about that balance all the time. And now here we've got a measure that can tell us. And then you have this other high frequency, low frequency ratio, which is a measure of sympathetic balance. So we have numbers that can, we can actually look at how this balance is functioning on a moment to moment basis and interpret then how any of these children in this study say are showing differential responsiveness, either on a physiological level or on a behavioral level to pain related stimuli or any other kind of events mm -hmm. and start to understand even better with different levels of analysis, why that's happening. Yeah. And that's exciting and, and super jazzing for me. So that's a long answer to your short question. A good answer, yeah. So, so I wonder kind of what, as you think about that and, and looking at this article with the, the, the pain so, stuff. So I, wanna, I wanna kind of jump in, couple, Go for it, Jerry. respond to a couple of things. One is, I think, in the literature in the field today, they have begun to talk about the embodied brain. Is that really we're talking about not this thing that sits in our skull, but this really this neural network that is in our body, in our guts, around our heart to kind of look at that and beginning to understand this embodied brain to kind of look at that. The other piece I, I wanna, is that Kurt kind of, um, said that the part of the nervous system's body is to respond to the environment. Well, that also includes the internal environment. Mm -hmm. And that really what the primary role of the stress response system is to regulate states, is to be able to change our internal states when there's external demands or internal demands and regulate those states, right? And so this concept of state regulation becomes really important. And the behaviors that we see are the individual or organism, however you want to describe it, it's their attempt to regulate their states, right? Is, is that if I move away from this thing that's threatening me, I will return back to a calm state. If I eat something, my state will change back to, so that our, our internal environment is constantly monitoring multiple systems in multiple states. And our stress response system is really a reaction to this interceptive process that's happening at all times. Some of it's conscious, some of it's unconscious, right? It's just happening. And so we have this incredible ability to reallocate resources based on state changes, right? And our behaviors we see have a lot to do with this internal process that we are looking at. So if we just look at the behavior, the behavior looks in some ways maladaptive to this environment, but in some ways that individual on a physiological level, that, it, that, that behavior is serving some internal function, mm -hmm. right? 
And so when we do functional analysis, we can't just look at the environment of what's going on, but we also have to look at on this physiological level, what is the function of that behavior in, in terms of managing these internal states, right? And I think that that's a lot of what Kurt defines as in the skin, mm-hmm. right? Is that these behaviors somehow are causing me to feel in some ways um, more, more, more better and more balanced internally, even though they're creating these disturbances in the external world. They're kind of looking at that piece. So having this measure kind of allows us to move away from a judgment about the behavior and assessing what the function is and then maybe helping that person find that function in a different way but we can in, in some ways look at the, how adaptive some of what we were seeing as maladaptive kind of work. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's an important part of this measurement component. Yeah. And, and two, my hope is that we can share with, with more people some of the things that I think the three of us have found having coming from different philosophical backgrounds and training backgrounds that we found ways to have some common language and some common mental models about what we're talking about Mm -hmm. so that we can share all these different perspectives to come to a more complete understanding. And I think that's something that's really kind of sorely missing in our, in our, in our collective fields is we tend to get in camps with our philosophical, you know, theoretical training backgrounds and and not be able to have conversations and discussions uh, because we use different words to describe very similar things. Right. I, uh, and so I think that that's really important. And some of this language of physiology can really help to bridge some of those gaps between people trained in a more behavioral, theoretical, philosophical background and others trained in a more psychological background. Uh, I think those two really need to talk to one another. Right. But also, it, it, that's right. And it also kind of uh, changes our thinking about, is this physical or is this psychological? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> right. Depends on your unit of analysis, basically. <laughs> That's right. That's well, well, and, and I, I think, you know, the, the whole Daniel Siegel definition of the mind, um, as, as you know, not, you know, the environment, relationships, the flow of energy and information, um, and, and really taking it out of the brain individually or the environment, but a collectiveness of all of that. And I, I think how those systems interact is, not not just from a, a behavioralist, psychological, you know, mental or what, what, however we want to divide it, but you know, you just think about how how important the health of the individual is in into all of this, and how diverse our uh, interventions uh, can, can be with nutrition, with exercise, you know, especially when we talk about heart rate. So much of that for me comes from my understanding as an athlete, and especially somebody who. Um, that dabbles into distance running from time to time and think trying to keep my heart rate at, at, a, at a lower and my breathing lower so I can run further, not necessarily faster. I'm not sprinting, but that, that I can get those miles in. So I think taking some of these things that even I learned about as an athlete per se, and now thinking about how that impacts our, our psychology as, as well. And, and I just think that it's, it's fascinating how many doors and uh, opportunities this opens up. I think it also increases the complexity because if you just think about, oh, we just got to change, uh, you know, this consequence reward structure in our classroom, you know, that's something kind of tangible that you can see. But when you start to really think about, well, what's, what's when this kid leaves the classroom and goes home and how's that walking into the classroom? How's what the kids are eating at breakfast or not eating, to, you know? So now we have all these different things. And I think that it's a beautiful complexity, um, but, but it shows that, that human beings, it's hard to say, hey, A equals B. Uh, that that gets a lot, lot harder because to even explain A, a equals B uh, takes a lot of really complexity. And so uh, I, I think that that's fascinating and opens up a lot of windows and a lot of partnerships, but I think it expands the realm of, you know, if you put healing or growth or wellness, uh, you know, we all have to get to the table in some way and really think about this from all those different perspectives, which 
I find fascinating and I, at times can be a little overwhelming to somebody who tries to keep somewhat on top of all this science coming out now too. One of the questions that uh, one of my friends asked me was, uh, she always wants to know about what to do about things, right? There's always, she, she's a big problem solver. So she's like, she's like, listen, Kurt, you can tell me like how to explain how to understand all this stuff all day long, but what I really want to know is what do I do about it? It's a great question. And, and so one of the things that I took from this article that kind of leads with what to do is to think about our, our kind of tendency as humans to infer intent when we see behavior in others. And so when you look at the way that the response pattern of these children with chronic pain, who had an attenuated response to pain related events, Right. When we see people in an environment, this happens so much, I think, in, in, our, in our treatment environments, that when people don't get organized by environmental events the way that we expect, then we start to infer intentions to those things. And in this sense, you can look at the way that these con uh, uh, children who had experienced chronic pain didn't get organized by pain-related events in their physiology and how that could translate into a behavioral response Right? They may not be moving away from pain or they may not be in moving towards a rewarding activity. We infer intent to those things. And that intent often gets characterized as something that is wrong with that person, right? that they're unmotivated or they're defiant or they're you know, some kind of disorder. And so using this kind of physiological understanding to start to understand how somebody could not be organized by environmental events, how their nervous system could contribute to that change in a behavioral response can help us, as Jerry said, so you're alluding to this, to help us to stay engaged with that person and look for new options where we might be able to get them to get engaged, right? Maybe pain-related stimuli is something that these children have actually experienced a tolerance to. Right? That would make some sense with this, this kind of presentation. They have chronic pain. We give them pain-related stimuli. Their, their system has already attenuated a response to pain-related events, so they don't get organized by it. They don't respond to it in the same way. Well, maybe we need to get them to get organized by something other than a pain-related event. Right? They, their nervous system could respond to something different. So as we think about designing environments that are enriched and have positive, repetitive, rewarding relational activities, that just helps us to think about more options. I tried this one and that didn't work. Maybe I need to try another one or another one and keep going through things in a, in a really kind of systematic, determined way to find something that people can and, and are able to get organized by. And that's something that I took from, from this article as a, a way to stay just engaged in the process of being a, a treatment provider or being a caregiver. That uh, help, it helps me to have a cognitive framework that, that makes me not give up, essentially. Uh, so that was one of my reactions to this article as well. Very cool. Do you want to touch on the other one as, as well, too? Yeah, we're getting, we're a little short on time. Do you want to keep going on into that one? Or do you want to hold that one off till next week? Because that's... Well, we could. Uh, why, don't we hold it, well, why don't we hold it off and, and maybe kind of talk a little bit about so what is the ramification? You know, we have people on it who are working with individuals who have experienced um, attachment disruptions, have experienced exposure to violence, have experienced homelessness, have experienced, um, you know, major losses or are some, how would this information help those individuals work with their clients if they if there were some takeaways and we can summarize from today's yeah you bet um so let's kind of talk about from a, uh, from an attachment perspective right it, it, when i think of that and I, I can really behavioralize a lot of things so if i kind of behavioralize some of the the concepts from attachment that one way we think about that is that it changes how the presence or absence of other people um, function as reinforcers or punishers in an environment, right? So we tend to regulate our internal states by being around others and being away from others. And most of us can titrate that and regulate that um, pretty freely, 
if I want to choose to be around others, then I can. If I want to choose to be away from others, I can do that too. And when, when we have children who have this disordered attachment or a reactive attachment, there's a reaction when people are with you and there's a reaction when people are away from you. And part of that reaction is in their behavior, which can be very troublesome, very frustrating to, to people around them. But some of that reaction is also in a nervous system. And so when people get close to, I've interviewed a lot of, a lot of kids with attachment disorders and, and one of the kind of themes that they say is when people get close to me, their experience is that I get scared and when they're gone, I miss them. And part of what they're describing there is that's their way of explaining what the experience of their bodily sensations is. And that's really driven by changes in their physiological states, which is associated with this parasympathetic sympathetic balance with heart rate variability. And we have ways of, of kind of measuring these things. So as we think about what it is for the, the, the kind of the meaning that we have when those, when kids do things to drive us away or when do, they do things to get us to come closer, um, having some cognitive structure about understanding what's happening inside of that person's body can help us to put less judgment on those symptoms and help us to stay engaged and more systematic about how we're actually engaging them intentionally. Right. Is, there, is there kind of uh, the question kind of to both of you though, I totally agree with what you're saying, Kurt, for sure about it gives us maybe some more compassion, patience in the work, but, but, but there seems to be a gap right now. And I, I just want to make sure you're seeing this, like I'm seeing it of, it really kind of stinks to know we don't know what's going on inside of them at the same time. So I think that there's, you know, while I totally agree that there's like compassion there, there's, I think the whole what happened to you versus what's wrong with you shifted in thinking is, is maybe one of the most powerful ones we, we've come across in psychology in a long, long time. Um, but, but yet I think for me, there's a little bit of a, a frustration there and it's just where we are I think scientifically and economically in our fields is I want to know what's going on in that person because what what I'm afraid of is if you think about how we've maybe structured school settings and uh, you know kind of consequences there I, I mean I just think about my experience in residential care I think about how we treat and structure interventions for people experiencing homelessness once we know about what's in the skin, a lot of this doesn't make sense, but yet the, we, we kind of have this collective data that can make us curious, but we don't, we're, we're kind of not at the point yet to say, okay, this is what's going on inside the skin. Now I know how to best help this person. And I just kind of wonder, like, what, what's your thoughts on that? Because I want this information now. I want the person to know, <laughs> some of these markers at least to say hey this person when i get close to them because i tell people to build empathy compassion rapport get get synchronization and for some people that might be triggering so you know how, how do we kind of use this information of there's sort of this curtain of uh we know that there's different stuff going on but we don't know necessarily what's going on when we're trying to help somebody right so so that's a really good point, right? Is that great that when we have the heart rate variability or we have the capacity to do all sorts of other measures, but really for the, for the uh, providers, most of them don't have access to that, right? But what we tend to do, Matt, just as you did, is we want to know what the story is. Mm -hmm. We're very cognitive. So, I need to know, actually, tell me the details of what you, happened to you, and then I can help you, right? And so really what we're learning is in trauma work, actually going in and talking about the details of what happened isn't really helpful for people, mm -hmm. right? It may be helpful for individuals who say they kept a secret for a very long time and now they could tell their secret, but the process more is, how do they begin to have more awareness and ability to regulate their internal states when managing these things, right? And so the, the question is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. But the next question is, 
when that's happening to you, what does that feel like? Mm -hmm. Right? So when you're, when you're um, struggling in class and not able to get something, tell me a little bit about what's going on inside of you as opposed to, let me just tell you what to do and not to do, right? When, when I'm meeting with you and you're telling me about how angry you are about not getting the housing net or somebody listening to you, it's like, so when you're angry, where do you feel that in your body, right? Is that when we become way more aware that we can actually increase our ability to increase our heart rate variability by being more mindful, we can actually help people begin to do that. And that's really difficult for people who have trauma, right? Because what I've asked them to do is stop and look inside, mm -hmm. right? And so in, in a way, what, this, what these measures do is they validate a lot of things that people have been doing really good in treatment. And they call into question other things we thought we were doing good and they really aren't very good, right? So we could say, yes, oh, I'm going to go in here and talk about my, my abuse. Well, if I check my heart rate variability, I'm actually maybe worse than I was before I went to you, right? So uh, again, is having this understanding is it pulls much more away from this cog just cognitive language of, lang of creating a narrative, which is an important component but it's the end process of having yourself regulated, being able to create a connection, and then be able to create some kind of narrative. It isn't where we start the treatment to kind of right. look at things. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and it also, you, go ahead, Kurt. I want to give you a couple of, of uh, uh, examples I'm thinking of, of how this information is used and it has been used very concretely in a couple of interventions. Um, so I was just talking to a, a group of uh, classroom staff that I consult with and some months ago uh, we were talking about a young girl in their class with a uh, you know one of our part of our rituals in this class is to say you know what what are the diagnosis the diagnoses that the child has like what are, what are the kind of the symptoms that we see and how do we characterize some of that and and what's their ACEs score that's like number two question so we have a sense of what has happened to this person and so as we went through that, we were, we had, we were orienting a new group, uh, some new staff to this classroom. And so we were kind of going through all the kids in the room. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do was to, in, instead of solely talking about all the challenges, how do you, you know, respond to the, what are all the risks, what are all the crisis response things, I wanted to have this new group of people understand what great work this classroom staff had done. And it reminded me of this intervention. I thought about it related to this article about and, and about attachment. Jerry, you're talking about that and it kind of reminded me. One of the things that we used was a transitional object to manage the relational disengagement that was inevitable in a classroom setting, right? This young girl who we were talking about had experienced ex extreme neglect, a lot of abuse, and, and she really had some disrupted attachment. And so she couldn't really tolerate people being with her and she could equally not tolerate them going away. And so one of the things that we did is we started talking about how at her developmental stage, kids often have an object that they carry around, which is often a permanent reminder of a caregiver and it helps them to tolerate the disengagement that happens. And so even though she was a little older than what this developmental stage would be, we said, we think that she's got this mismatch between developmental and chronological age. And so we're, we want to use this as an intervention. And interestingly, when we talked about it, the classroom staff at that time, this was some months ago, they said, oh, well, she, she loves to always bring a, a stuffed animal to school. We're always having to tell her to put it away. <laughs> I'm like, she's carrying around a transitional object. How about we go, let's use that? <laughs> they were like, yeah, let's do it. And so we started, we were like, well, how do we pick one? And this was a great, great opportunity to really kind of connect this staff with understanding this inside the skin kind of, of orientation to what was happening with this child. And so we started um, testing her. We did a little, a little pulse oximeter and we took her heart rate around multiple stuffed objects. And we found the one that actually calmed her down by measuring her heart rate. And that's the one we picked. 
And so what this staff would do when they were working with her one-on-one -on -one and they were going to have to leave to go to another part of the room is they would pick up this little stuffed animal and they would hand it to her and say, I have to go, but I want you to hold on to this until I come back. And it took about three weeks and her reaction to relational disengagement was gone. And so it resulted in a very, very clear change in behavior driven by this kind of like way of looking at, at, at everything that was happening to her, both how her symptoms were interacting with her environment, how we could slightly shift those interactions that would capture a change in her behavior very, very quickly and really kind of pull her in this developmentally advanced direction of being able to tolerate a little bit of relational engagement and an understanding of how this, this specific object had an impact very clearly by measuring her heart rate when she was around it in calming her and the staff could really then kind of visualize that when I give you this object, it calms you down. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that I can move away from you and you can tolerate it until I come back. So I, I just wanna throw that out there as a way to kind of pull some of these together in how we can think about interacting with kids. And this is in a classroom, which, which I know you love to talk about, you know, trauma-informed schools. So, um, and that didn't require a change in how that classroom was designed. It didn't require a change in how the education was presented or curriculum changes. It really had to do with a change in how the staff behaved in relationship to this, to the, to this young girl. And one of the real great ways I think of using this data, this kind of using heart rate monitors in some of this physiological data is that it captures a component of habit formation and behavior change that's missing in a lot of the ways we try and change staff behavior. In that, you know, the three critical components of habit formation are a cue, the behavior, and a reward. And those are three critical components. And one of the things that's missing when we think about changing the behavior of staff in relation to these kids is an appropriate cue. Like, when do I need to move closer? When do I need to move away? And using something like the, uh, the internal state of the child and bringing that outside the skin so everybody can have access to it, you now have a cue that can occasion the right behavior. And if that then captures some change in that child's behavior, you now have a reward that starts to complete that whole three-part component of changing new habits and changing the behavior of staff. So it puts together some of those kind of behavioral components of, of how we change the habits of people interacting with, with those who've, who've experienced trauma. Right, and, and to kind of piggyback on that and follow up, is your clients are giving you cues all the time. We just have to become more sensitive reading cues. Is that just like when infants are born, there are some infants that are really good at cueing their caregivers and some that are hard to read, but they are giving cues, they're just harder to read. Yeah. And so when you have a child like that, she was actually giving you a lot of cues but you weren't recognized. You were saying the rule says you can't have a stuffed animal in there, in, in, right? You were rule bound, as you would say, as opposed to responding. So I, I think that for individuals who don't have these measurements, if you watch your client's body language, if you watch sometimes even the coloring in their face or the dilation in their eyes or, or the tone of their voice, you will see signals of change in states. And you can then begin to adjust your behavior based on that, those observations to kind of look at that. But it, 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 re it really is helpful when you begin to not kind of focus just on the cognitions of what the person does or the language that they're using, the content, but begin to watch some of these physiological cues to guide you in your interactions. Oh, the complexity. I love it. <laughs> and I just think that it shows, I mean, and how, you know, you know, I, th I think in that I don't want to open this big can of worms, but a lot of times I think too, the interventions that we try to do uh, to address issues, like, you know, I, I just think about the most obvious one is putting someone who commits a crime, especially with a history of trauma in a prison. Um, you, you know, what, what, what worst environment could we create uh, to help someone change behavior with a history of trauma? I, I think some of the, 
the classroom interventions that, that we've done historically, suspending kids from school. Um, you know, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I wish we could almost just hit a reset and re-examine a lot of this stuff. I think it makes it a lot harder when we have these ingrained uh, things that we're sort of working against. But I think at the same time, it, it's fascinating to think about how this will inform our work moving forward as well. I mean, I, I think it's equally parts exciting. And it's like when I start to really think about okay, if a criminal justice system wants to really take this seriously and implement it, or, or even a school system under the current funding structures, how would we do that? And, and, you know, it's just a lot of small steps in a lot of ways, like Jerry said, is to be, be curious and, and try, to, try to connect with where they're at. And I, I have a huge amount of empathy for, uh, you know, my wife who stands in front of 23, 24, first graders and tries to manage all those states uh, one on 24. And it's, 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 I think really shows why we've struggled, but the, the brilliance that's out there that, that we've had, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, we, we've had helped a lot of people uh, it, with, with this knowledge kind of coming just here recently as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to hold because it's like, there's so much there that we could do so much with and yet, you know, again, change is a, a systematic, slow process. Right. So, so to end this, we have probably less chance of helping our clients, our students, our communities when we have low heart rate availability, right? So that I think the takeaway is if we want to be more helpful, it isn't necessarily first to change our client's heart rate variability, but how can we actually work on having increased ability to manage and regulate our own internal states? When we could do that, then we could be open and curious and creative and innovative in solutions that we find. But when we get dysregulated, we move to short-term decision-making, focused on potential threats in the environment, it changes our behavior. So the takeaway of some of this information is not just for our clients, but is that it's for all of our nervous systems. Great tie into the bright, shiny object, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Kurt, let me ask a final question coming off of Jerry. I know I just should end it there, but, but I, gotta, I gotta ask one more because I think he brings up a great point because you know, you don't go to a Matt Bennett training anymore without hearing the word mindfulness. It, it is there. So, uh, Jerry, 100% agreement uh, is the one internal environment that we do have a, well, do, it depends on who you ask, but we, we do have probably the most control over, at least, is our own and how integral that is to, to our work as helpers. I guess I want to kind of throw out a last question here, though, is, when we look at setting up therapeutic environments, be that a classroom, be that a residential treatment, whatever, a shelter, whatever we're talking about, you know, I, I want to say that thinking about environments uh, that are very safe, um, that are, you know, have trusting relationships, everything we've, we've always talked about, really what we're trying to do is create environments that promote a high rate of heart variability <laughs> higher heart rate variability <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm taking that as you tell me good job matt <laughs> <laughs> autonomic <laughs> greater, greater, greater parasympathetic influence really helps us to regulate our whole system Excellent. So I'm just going to say, yeah, Matt, you're right. So <laughs> there, there you go. There's the takeaway. Uh, uh, so this has been I a think, fascinating I think strategy uh, was to make a long enough statement that it's impossible to disagree with it. There we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you just gave me a positive reward for it. So <laughs> our listeners can blame you next time. <laughs> So great discussion. Um, again, I, I in the show notes, um, I will both have this week's article. And since we only got to one this week, uh, next week's article as well, if you want to read that ahead of time. Um, all that, again, is at traumainformlens.org. And you can find, I got some discussion questions up for there. Uh, find videos, um, links, resources, 
all that fun stuff. So Kurt, Jerry, another great conversation. Um, we'll see you all next week as we'll, we'll continue this exploration into our hearts. joining us for this episode. If you're interested in more information about HRV, please visit us at OptimalHRV.com. Also, if you visit OptimalHRV.com, you'll be able to sign up for our email list and download our free ebook, Healing with HRV. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next episode.